so uh, hello everyone i welcome you to our uh, show net zero speaks so i am your host for today sahil from team india can the next generation of climate leaders be trained to solve the crisis faster smarter and more equitably than ever before and to help us this we are joined by one of the world top climate educator and innovators dean alexis abramson she is the head of the columbia climate school a scientist engineer a government advisor and climate tech entrepreneur dean abramson is reimagining climate education to deliver real world solution let's dive into how columbia is becoming a global force for sustainable change so uh, let's start with our you know uh, first question you have called columbia's climate schools a new paradigm what does a solution focused multidisciplinary climate education actually look like in action and how will it prepare future leaders to make faster and smarter decisions on net zero so As you mentioned Sahil, I really think of the climate school here at Columbia as being this new paradigm in higher education. What does that mean? Well, if you think about schools, particularly schools in the US, but but abroad in Asia and Europe as well, right? Schools are very disciplinary focused within the context of a university. So, you have a medical school or an engineering school and a business school. And while there are certainly multiple disciplines within those overarching disciplines, they're not like what we do here at the climate school. We have faculty and students that have backgrounds across disciplines, so engineering and science, business, policy, human health, and they're all within one umbrella. So having that one umbrella enables us to really move in I would say a faster way. and how that will help us solve this complex problem of ch- climate change it is inspiration for us like but the work you are doing in your uh, you know climate school uh, how you think that this type of initiative can be adopted by uh, you know other nations of the world one is really to go all in on that interdisciplinary aspect again i think it's quite unusual to really almost force those disciplines to come together sometimes you need a facilitator because a policy maker and an engineer might speak very different languages about the same thing right an engineer might be trying to develop a new material for solar for example and not really thinking about oh my goodness that solar new material is like 10 times the cost they should be talking to their business colleagues really early on So uh my recommendation is making sure that you have those facilitated conversations very early on so that you're really considering all the aspects about the potential solutions for your particular location before you kind of go down that that path and then realize maybe a couple years in that maybe it wasn't the best path to go down after all. you are an engineer and former department of energy leader how do you plan to leverage cutting edge technology like building efficiency ai and climate analytics to help scale impact at columbia and beyond great question uh, we're hearing a lot about ai in particular these days the best way to really have that kind of impact and move cutting edge technology forward is to engage as many people as many bright minds as possible globally that have great new ideas about how to move those technologies forward more specifically as you mentioned my area is related to building efficiency uh and there's a lot we can do with buildings but the majority of buildings out there being are being built in sort of traditional ways right we call them sometimes stick building right putting up wood after wood or concrete block after concrete block to build it but there are many new technologies out there to help with insulation to help with windows to help with heating and cooling systems and it's really important to see them scale right to have the impact we want them to have it's really important to make sure that there is cost effective as possible 
So a lot of people are working on that. We've seen, for example, the cost of solar go down tremendously over the last couple of decades. And that's because you have a lot of people working on how to innovate in ways to make those solar panels and their installation more cost effective. And then, of course, AI is also being used more and more in the company that I founded, Edifice Analytics. Uh, we're taking whole building electricity data and we're saying that's valuable data. How can we use it to really understand what's going inside, going on inside the building? So there's a lot of advancements happening in that area. So we see you think of energy as being a very technology heavy, hardware heavy area. You see a lot more software really pushing innovation. You talked about solar panels and over. After 50 years, what will be the future uh, of energy in the uh, worldwide? Solar panels are actually not very efficient. Um, if you think about it, what we're trying to do is take the sun's energy and convert it to electricity. And a lot of that, the sun's energy actually goes to waste heat. We have this question, right, to get a higher efficiency, right, a higher conversion of, of the sun's energy into electricity. We might need to use alternative materials, alternative to silicon, which is really what's being used now. If we're really talking 50 years from now, we really should be thinking about whether fusion will be part of the energy landscape. So fusion has been researched for many, many years and people always joke, it's always 50 years away from actually seeing commercial application. But in the last 10 years, there's been some remarkable advancements in fusion that make me think that actually fusion is closer maybe 10 years or so till we see sort of some level of commercial deployment of fusion. So that's in my lifetime. So I'm super excited about, about seeing that, how uh, everything with fusion uh, develops and unfolds. So this shows that you have championed equity and inclusion in the STEM and climate innovation. How can Columbia Climate School ensure that undeserved communities are not only protected but empowered to shape climate solutions. Absolutely it has to be part of the solution set, right? That we're thinking about vulnerable and underserved communities as part of our approach that we're taking to mitigate climate change and its effects. That making sure that the global population has access to low cost energy is incredibly important. We've seen such a linkage between access to energy and economic development. So that's really important to think about how to get some of those uh, energy resources to those communities. But one other piece of this is climate adaptation. And a lot of what's happening in countries where there's high levels of emis emission, the impact of rising temperatures and climate change are leading to things like floods and hurricanes and other natural disasters in other parts of the world that can be directly linked to climate change. And so things like access to food is becoming a problem, agricultural issues, flooding, a disaster management. And so we have a lot of work at the Columbia Climate School that's focused on climate adaptation. For example, we have a center that's focused on food and how um, to think about bringing resources to certain parts of the world so who have to adjust their agricultural practices to deal with rising temperatures or drought or other issues that are arising because of climate change. And so we're doing a lot of work to help think about that and bring those resources to those communities. You also uh, co-founded a startup and advised Breakthrough Energy Ventures. How do you see Colombia's role in accelerating climate entrepreneurship and what would your message be to students ready to build the next generation of climate tech? Great question. And I think this actually links to your first question too, sort of how the climate school is a new paradigm in higher education, in part because we have this unique emphasis on impact. 
And so as a climate school, how do we think about enabling sort of rapid translation into the marketplace or into policies or business models or healthcare solutions and beyond? And so that could be through entrepreneurship. There are other ways to translate like into a policy. We're putting those teams together, like I was referring to early, to ensure that we can accelerate that translation of those technologies into startup companies that then find ways to scale and beyond. So I think a real important piece to that acceleration is really making sure you have all of the people at the table who might have a say in a few years once that technology is getting to the marketplace, have them at the table early on. And then your, your second part of your question around messaging to students to build the next generation of climate tech. And it may seem a little bit different from most of the messages students might be getting. And I think there's been this real push to go have students study a lot of science and math and engineering and move in that direction. And I agree, that's absolutely important. I'm an engineer myself. I think what isn't happening enough is that students, particularly older students, high school students, college students, aren't spending enough time learning about these other elements, right? That if you're an engineering student, you should also be taking a class on policy. You should be taking a class on business. Take a class on anthropology because understanding cultures is actually really important to accelerating the translation of technologies into the world. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your powerful vision for climate education and innovation. Your leadership is helping redefine what it means to act on climate and who gets to beat. So this is Sahil Soni, adding my voice to young leaders everywhere. We are watching, we are acting, and we believe that together we can achieve net zero. Thank you so much.